many of you here tonight that certainly are thrilled to have you. And we hope that you will feel repaid by the effort that you have made to get here. I have just a little resume to begin the program, and that will be carried on later in more detail by other members. <coughs> the town of Menden was organized in the year of 1812 by the formulation of Menden, Victor, and Bloomfield from the then existing large town of Bloomfield. I'm so glad that I had that right since we started the show. <laughs> this town constituted the last remaining part of lands owned by Phelps and Dorn to be sold prior to the to the transfer of their interests to others. Settlement in this heavily wooded region progressed rapidly to 1810, and much of the timber when cut was burned to make potash. It is reported that revenue derived from the sale of potash ran from four to eight dollars per acre and kept many families from dire want until their land began to produce agricultural products. Canandaigua was the principal trading center for the vicinity in the earlier days, although Hanoi Falls became the industrial and shopping center of the town in later years. Menden never acquired the importance of Hanoi Falls because of its lack of mill privileges. Ebenezer Barnard settled in Menden, also Jonas Allen, formerly of Stockbridge, Massachusetts. In 1855, Menden consisted of two churches, a steam flour mill, a steam saw mill, a foundry, two general stores, and about 200 inhabitants. <coughs> In 1813, the first town officers were Cornelius Treat, Charles Day, and Daniel Dunks. The school districts numbered 10 in 1820. Records show that Brigham Young's father owned the strip of land from Cheese Factory Road south along a creek to the woods, now owned by Robert Hutchinson. It was this creek upon which his chair factory was located. About 1900, Mr. Hutchinson Sr., while digging post holes near said creek, unearthed several bricks, one of which is engraved with a V. And this brick is the only authentic thing I might say that we have. And the initial is on here, and we hope you will see it before you leave. Many of our Salt Lake City visitors have vouched for the fact that documents signed by Brigham, bear the same style initial. Brigham Young's first wife was buried in the Baldwin Hill Cemetery, uh, a short distance from the Menden, Ionia Road. Menden is 512 feet above sea level at Aronicoy Creek and the East Town Line boundary, <coughs> and 1,037 feet in the Hopper Hills near the southeast corner of the town. This is the highest land in Monroe County and is nearly 800 feet above Lake Ontario. In the Hopper Hills, there are uh, various types of woods uh, of uh, lumber, a variety of trees, shrubs, gumwoods, cucumber, and so forth. I endeavored to get information in regard to the old cheese factory, but when I was unable to find anything except that it was originated by a stock company. Perhaps someone here has something uh, to help us reminisce more about that. And, but Menham Village itself had several firsts. It had its first church, was built on Taylor Road in 1820. Now where, I don't know, perhaps some of you people do. Does anybody happen to know where that first church on Taylor Road was? Well, it was on the um on the northwest corner uh, of uh, West Bloomfield and uh, Taylor Road. Yeah. What is known as Menden Village was at that time called East Menden. And the location of the first post office was established in the town by Horace Wheeler. 
The first grist mill was built by Milton Sheldon and Daniel Allen in 1826. The entertainment of travelers and emigrants, which had begun in hospitality, soon ended in a charge for accommodations, and hence arose the tavern, first a log cabin, then a more commodious structure. I think perhaps Mr. Hodge is going to tell us more about one of those later. The first church was built in the town on Taylor Street in 1820, as I mentioned before. The first birth in town was in 1795, William Sterling. First death, 1795, Mrs. Cornelius Tree. And the first lawyer was Mr. Chamberlain. At this time, we'll hear from some of our town people who will give us a more detailed history of the village of Benham. First, we will hear from Mrs. Warren McGill, who will tell us about the academy, the building in which we are. There were 10 school districts in the town of Benton and 632 children between the ages of 5 and 15 attended those schools. In 1835, there were 17 school districts. It was in 1835 the Benton Academy was established, which in 1839 became Benton School Number 2. The first public school was located one mile west of Mendham, and uh, the teachers were uh, Miss Anna Smith and Miss Eunice Rust. The first teacher at the academy was the Reverend Stone, and of course this building was the academy. This was a private school consisting of two rooms and a large assembly room above. When the academy became a public school, eight grades were taught, and it had the two rooms. Uh, many of you can recall many of the teachers who taught before my time in this school. Uh, I intended to ask my husband for some of those, and I forgot to. Uh, I, I can remember Miss O'Connor and. Uh, Miss Emmite, who is now Mrs. Brady, and uh, I think, did Mr. Dave O'Connor teach here too? Yeah, I'm almost sure. And perhaps somebody else can tell you some more of those. Um, my teaching in this school began in 1925. At that time, there were between 45 and 50 children attending the two grades. And I had the grades six through eight, with an average of 25 children in the room. Gradually, this room went down to about 15 children in the entire school. And so it was made into a one-room school. And I then taught grades one through six. At that time, the seventh and eighth grades were sent to Hanel Falls. Children finishing the eighth grade had a choice of going to Honeyla Falls or Victor or Pittsburgh. Then in 1950, this district was consolidated with Honeyla Falls Central, and all the children were, as now, transported to Honeyla Falls. Uh, when the region's examinations were given, uh, the schools in this area uh, sent the children either to this school or to Hanyard Falls because these two schools were the only two schools who uh, gave regents examinations. Part of our duty uh, was to make up the tax roll, the school for the school tax, and that was, took quite a long time and uh, quite a little work, extra work. At election time, we gave literacy tests um, to those who required it in order to vote. And uh, those who had to have a test came into the school uh, room and took their test, and uh, the teachers went right along with their work as usual. And oftentimes they came at night, and of course, I held them over in my home. Um, I could 
tell you many interesting things that happened while I was teaching here in this school. Uh, we certainly, I certainly enjoyed my many years here. Um, the school, I think, as a whole, can be very proud of the fact uh, that they have turned out many very fine students who went on to colleges uh, all over, University of Rochester, uh, Yale. Uh, I can't begin to remember all of them, Elmira, and uh, many of the children went on further than their high school. Uh, perhaps you'd like to know one or two interesting things that happened while I was in school. I remember once when we were giving regents examinations, a swarm of bees came in through the window. <laughs> and it was, this was the smaller room, this was the larger room, and you could see where it was divided. The, uh, well, we just couldn't stay in the room, so we had to go into the other room and shut that room off entirely. Uh, after hours, we called Mr. Frost, and he came down and took out many quarts of honey that come upstairs. One of the boys told me that there's uh, the bees still swarm upstairs. Now whether I that's true or not, I don't know. Another time, one of the funny things perhaps might have been very serious uh, happened. Uh, the register was about there where Mrs. Broomfield was sitting. We were having class in front of the room and all at once flames just shot right up through the register. At that time, uh, we didn't have water pumped into the schoolhouse, but we always had a pail of water over here for drinking, so I simply said to one of the children, get the water pail quickly. And he did, and he just poured it right down that register. Well, of course, the fire was out immediately. Fortunately, nobody was standing over the register at the time. <laughs> Another uh, funny thing that happened to me, wasn't so funny at the time, but I often laugh about it now. Uh, I was in the little room after school one evening, and the register there was very close to the blackboard. I was putting work on the board and stepped onto the register, not realizing that there was anything wrong with it at all, and down my went right through the register. <laughs>
that uh, the information was gathered from June Turner and uh, Lily Schlaber. The Lehigh Valley Depot, Atlanta. Mr. Hudson and Clyde Harn, Clyde Harn was the first station master in Mendon about 1890. Darren H. Turner was sent to Mendon Depot and station, as station master about 1900 to re relieve Mr. Harn. At that time, Archibald Barnhart was the telegraph operator. Mr. Turner lived with his wife and two daughters, June and Wilma. Where June now lives, where June now lives, Mr. Barnhart lives with his wife and three children in a Carmichael house on the Miss Hoffman property, now owned by Wallace Albuquerque. There was considerable shipping of produce for many years by Mr. Frank Ely, Mr. David O'Connor, Mr. John Finn, and Mr. Fred Dunn. They bought the farmer's produce and sent it out and brought in coal and sold it in turn to the <coughs> inhabitants about Mecca. There was also considerable express, but probably no partial post handled. As volume of shipping fell off, the operator was finally dispersed with Mr. Turner, quit March 31st, 1938. There was east and west bound AM and PM locals, arrangements, and they made for, for two trains to discharge passengers or take on passengers. These stops were in freedom. The main room was left open for a few years after the station master was dispensed with. Miss Lily Slater carried the mail to and from the station and the post office for many years. She was obliged to resign in 1947 because of ill health. For many years, the mail came into Madeline four times a day and went out twice a day. The depot was torn down and there's no day here then. I meant to find out the date, but I guess I forgot all about it. <laughs> the date is right here. And this June Turner has a sign which she purchased for one dollar when it was removed. Information from Miss June Turner by and Miss Lily Slater. Mr. William Wing, Bessie Lawrence's grandfather, furnished a team of horses at the building of the railroad to Mendel. I suppose many other farmers did also. This was written by Bessie Lawrence. Thank you very much. <coughs> I think at this time Warren McGill has something for us in regard to the Baptist Church, which used to be out here on the hill. The same residue is all the way. And that tape holder is still on the same. It's very low. This is so hard to go. I think I always remember the. Uh, well, I call it a band spell or something, that they emerged the people they went right on the stage. <laughs> they uncovered it. <laughs> I have to <laughs> I think perhaps at this time, Mrs. George Zilbert can tell us something about the Lutheran Church. <coughs> the uh, first Lutheran service of worship in heaven was conducted in the rear of the present Reading Green Hall on September 15, 1901. A couple of months later, the congregation was organized at a meeting that was held at the home of Mr. Lewis Ernst. And maybe for some folks who don't know, um, that is where the Green Hills Country Club Golf Club is now. Um, after they were organized, they uh, rented a hall from Mr. Thomas Manukin, which was here next to the creek um, for $50 a year. And uh, they had service there until 1904. It was felt that a permanent church building was needed, so a building lot across the street from the present men and cemetery was considered. But after some discussion, it was decided to locate in the village. So the uh, present site was purchased where the Lutheran Church is now on the Victor Road from Mr. Ethan Davis for 
dollars. The pastor at the time was Reverend Barco, and uh, the three elders who uh, made the transaction bought the lot were Mr. Ernst, Mr. Bruce Ernst, uh, Mr. Henry Schultz, and Godfrey Zuber. That Joe building was built by Mr. Fane Forsyth. Uh, I don't know where he was from. I think he was from Ionia. The cost of the materials uh, were two thousand four hundred nineteen dollars and thirty one cents. The interior furnishings cost you four hundred dollars, uh, and the church building was dedicated September twenty fifth, nineteen four. The ladies' aid was organized in nineteen five, and uh, a young people's society was organized in nineteen seven which was, uh, which since has been disbanded. Uh, but now we do have a Walter League for the young folks, and also a Walter Layman's League. And in 1951, the year of, uh, when we celebrate at Golden Jubilee, the interior of the church was completely renovated. And uh, more recently, I, I don't even, Remember that four or five years ago we added the addition in the back. And uh, Mrs. Lewis Ernst, which all of you know, I guess, is Mrs. Earl Ernst's mother, she is the only surviving charter member. Thank you very much, Lillian. I think perhaps at this time we'll hear something about the old first mill by Mr. Lester Ernst of the church.
Uh, on December 8, uh, 1825, Jonas Allen made a will in which he bequeathed 10 acres of land and buildings to his wife, Ruby. And the remainder of the land was divided to people among his uh, three sons, Ethan Allen, Daniel Allen, and George Allen. Uh, however, that was just the making of the will the men had passed on until later. On April 18, 1829, Ethan Allen and his wife, Catherine, needed their part to Ruby Allen. In other words, one of the sons needed their part back to the mother. On September 24, 1835, George Allen and his wife, uh, Miriam, transferred their share to Daniel Allen. Now, this involved more than just the property on which the mill was located. At one time, that property, I believe, included some of the land that is right around the schoolhouse. From having read these documents, it appears that way. And it was sold off in pieces until it got down to the, the final uh, uh, piece of land on which the mill was located. Uh, subsequently, on October 3rd, 1836, Ruby Allen gave a warranty deed to Daniel Allen for the undivided one-third part of the ten acres, a form of deed by Ethan Allen and his wife to Ruby Allen. <coughs> Here in this document is the first mention of the town of Memphis. Well, I guess it was mentioned that happened in 1812, and this was after that, so it did mention the town of Memphis. On April 16, 1866, Daniel Allen paid to Mason Eckler a considerable portion of the land, excluding a two-rod road uh, leading from the highway, and that highway was known as the Benton Corners Victor Highway, to a uh, grist mill situated on a lot, uh, and the mill was then conducted by uh, Nathan Stone. It also mentions as well another exception to the uh, to this. Uh, Parcel of property that was uh, deeded was land sold by Daniel Allen and uh, Milton Sheldon to Hugh Sherry for $1,200. Uh, Mason Eckler and his wife Julie transferred title to some of the property to Leonard Cambridge in 1875. Other portions of the town of Daniel Allen on April 24, 1879, William Angler. And uh, I do remember as a small boy, William Eckler. So that shows you how far back I go. <laughs> Just because I couldn't go back because I was in my own life. When you look at this document, there is mention of the highway in town from the Mr. the sawmill. And the sawmill was uh, across the Ironside Creek from the Dexter uh, Mill. It was west of it. It mentions the uh, highway in town. On that sawmill, the main street of London is called Mill Road. I don't know if it's still called Mill Road or not, but I don't remember that before. I don't remember everyone who lived there. Another transfer was made to William Eckler on November the 13th, 1879. Now this is outside the actual mill property, but it borders around the pond, and uh, I think would be of interest in connection with the mill. On April 1st, 1880, William Eckler and his wife Francis sold some of the land to Fred Bartlett, on which I remember Mr. Bartlett, Bill and I thought, you probably some of you remember, that he used to cut ice on the pond and store it in the ice house, use it in his meat market, and also sell the ice to put them on the bike. Following that, there was an assignment uh, to credit it by William Lecter, uh, yes, to credit it by William Lecter, to Smith Porter, and some of you may remember Smith Porter. Then I find a tax inspector licensed uh, with him, sold by the line to the Buffalo and Geneva Railway Company, which later became what we know as the Lehigh Valley Railroad. This uh, was dated November 4, 1889. Then there were some mortgage assignments and uh, releases involving Nathan Cole in 1884 and 1889. Apparently there was some financial difficulty there and had to be straightened out by someone who had the ready cash. Uh, to go back a little, the property changed to owner several times in the period from 1871 for various reasons and for very different sums of money. It was sold at one time to the property, and that was a shared sale, for $100. Other times it mentions in the documents $1,100, $1,000, so it went all the way from 100 to 1200 
for a little matter. There's a record of Mary Stone obtaining a judgment of $1,550 against the Leland Valley Railroad for damages resulting from placing bridge abutments. This was dated January the 29th, 1895. Uh, apparently when the Lehigh built the bridge, which is back of that property, they uh, they built it so that they backed up the water and <laughs> she was able to collect fifteen hundred and fifty dollars from them for that damage. Mm -hmm. On May the th uh, November the thirty third, eighteen ninety seven, the mill property including the grist mill, house and barn was sold by Mary Stone to my grandfather, Gary Terrence. And uh, he had to take a $500 mortgage along with it. It's, it's part of the money that I uh, believe was uh, loaned out of that uh, 1650 that they got from the Leonard Valley Railroad. On July 1st, 1901, my grandfather sold the property to my father's residence. It still gave a $500 mortgage. There's an interesting note in the deed which reads, and I quote, there is a will of one president of the town of Pittsburgh, recorded in uh, letter 839 of D, page uh, 150. I think that was inserted in there to be sure that the two presidents were confused. One was in Pittsburgh and the other, my father was in Denver, of course. And the president didn't want to be sure that the two presidents were confused. Then I went to the 1922, my father sold the Bristol Valley. And his wife I did that was on. The deed reserves to the members the same rights, easements, and purposes as the original deed. 